Good evening, and, and thank you very much for the invitation to come and talk about Must Farm. Um, there are three Must Farms for me. One is the site, a settlement, a pile dwelling that burnt down 3,000 years ago. Second one is a landscape that I've been exploring um, since 2004. The third is a, is a brick pit, a quarry, a, a big hole in the fens. So what I want to do this evening, if I can, is, is give a sense of of that landscape, but also give a sense of, of that site. And on the way, there's going to be a sort of journey, I suppose, a, a narrative of, of my time spent in the fens and that sort of sense of starting above the peat and ending up below the peat and, and what that might mean in terms of our understanding of Fenland as a, as a sediment, but also as a, an archaeological site and the possibility that what we found at Mus Farm might actually represent something the beginning of something rather than just a, a single excavation or a single find. The other thing to say is that the archaeology that I'm going to show is, is sponsored or, or has been funded by um, different organisations, but in particular by Historic England and by Forterra, which are the, the quarry company. Um, so it's a sense really of what's been made possible by, by their, their contribution towards these projects. My, my title, um, tenure and texture, the, the reason I wanted to use those terms really, I suppose, texture might be a, a bit obvious, I suppose, working in the fens in the sense that there's lots of sediment and it tends to be quite wet, but there's also a sense there of preservation, the idea that we get to see things perhaps we wouldn't see on the sort of normal sort of dry land sites and things. But also I think texture in terms of, of people's sort of interaction with the sort of the ecology, the, the, what we might call the sort of social ecology. And then tenure, which is something really important to me, I think, in the sense of looking at the conditions under which land was occupied, sort of durations and temporalities, and, and, and the scale of things. And I think, if nothing else, in, in my presentation, I think it's this idea of what are we looking at within this, this window into the fens, and what does it tell us about the rest of Fenland, and that, that the implications. But before I, I really get started, I suppose I, I'd like to just put us into the context of the fens itself and, that, and think about it as a landscape and, and think about its, its flatness, its horizontalness, its, its this sort of superficiality of this landscape. A landscape without features, um, a place that's prostrate. It's uh, a sense that the topography is, is perhaps sometimes is sort of mistaken for it being sort of uninteresting in things and the possibility that there might be more to the fens than what meets the eye on the surface. And what I like about it is this, and this is something that sort of Graham Swift sort of talked about when he wrote the book Waterland, was this idea that we, he chose the fens because he saw it as being this sort of ideal non-setting, this ideal flat, bare platform onto which to play out a sort of human story, a narrative. But he realised as, as he finished the book was that the fens became a central character. It, was, it had depth, it had a, a complexity, complexity about it that actually made the human story all the better. And I think... And, and I think it comes across in this painting of the fens is that there's that sense of a sort of brooding depth. And I think, if anything, I've learned from working in this landscape is that what it lacks in height, it makes up for in depth. And it's that depth and that verticality, I think, is what expresses the archaeology or allows us to, to articulate British prehistory in ways that we haven't been able to do, perhaps, on other excavations. And it's not just about the fact that it's wet and it's not just about organic preservation. It's actually about sediment interceding and, and, and keeping palimpsest apart and articulating past patterns of occupation. So that's the other thing I think I want to get across in my presentation is that sense of, of a landscape. The sort of paradox, I suppose, of the fens is that it's full of things it's just almost impossible to find and how we go about trying to reconcile that, that paradox. So we can locate ourselves on a, on a map of England and we're a big red blob, we're the fens, we are 100% obscured according to the English um, Landscapes and Identities Project. We are, we are covered in a thick blanket of peat. Um, it's this sense of, of a black hole, a sense of a landscape that we know lots about its sort of perimeters, its edges, but very little about its, its sort of deep, thick blanket of peat and silt. So it's, it's trying to sort of think about this, the scale of that space, I suppose, and its relationship to the to the sort of the landscapes around it. But of course, it's not really that obscured, and it's not really just a blank sort of 
layer of peat is actually, it's, it has a subtlety about it, both in terms of its sediment, but also in terms of its topography. And this image is a, is a, a LIDAR-generated image of, of Fenland, and, it, and it, it basically, it shows relief, it shows topography, and it gives colour to that. And what happens is, is that it starts to give this landscape grain, and it starts to give you a sort of sense that there is something more going on than just a sort of flat, prostrate sort of space. The other thing that this does for me, I think, in terms of, of an image of the fence is it gives you a sense of the altitude. So you can see that the, the southern half of the fence is the same colour as the wash. It's the sense that we're already starting at sea level before we even start sort of excavating into those sediments. And what I want you to focus on in this map is, is if I go with the cursor, as you can see, there's a little sort of fish-shaped island just here with a big blue dot on the end. Well, that fish-shaped island is the island of Whittlesea, and the blue dot are the Whittlesea brick pits. And that's where I've been spending most of my time, and that's the, the sort of aperture on these sort of deep sediments that I've been very fortunate to work in. So if we go in a bit closer, we can see those blue dots. They're, they're, their colour is, is basically expressing their depth. They are the, the biggest holes in Fenland. And you can see how they cut big chunks out of the island of Whittlesea. You can also see the River Neen in its canalised form cutting across the sediment. But perhaps more importantly in terms of our story is that you can see these sort of dendritic patterns of formal channels and rivers and things that are starting to come to the surface of, of the Fenon Basin. And it's those rivers that form the context of our investigation. So if we take the colour away and just go on relief and on topography, we can see that, that island again. You can see the big holes of the brick pits. So here, here are the, the brick pits in here. And if we, if we colour that image in, we can create the land and we can see how the island of Whittlesea sort of emerges out of the sediment. We can also see we've got... This, these, are the, these buildings here are the, the foreshore of Peterborough. That's Fengate. This is Francis Prize landscapes of prehistoric field systems. Um, and this here is known as the, the Flag Fen Basin. But what this image does is it starts to sort of dissipate this idea of a, a little embayment on the edge of the fence and starts to bring it into the, the greater Fenland context and things. And we can do that even more by highlighting one, by one of these dendritic channels that goes between the, the, the high ground. And this is the Musharm Paleo Channel. And this is one of many of these rivers that are starting to come to the surface within the fence. And over the past three or four years, I've been working with students from Birkbeck um, and we've been going out into farmers' fields and, and tracking this, this channel across the top of the fens in order to take ourselves out of the quarry and think about the context of our site in the, in the sort of greater story of, of, of Fenland itself. So if we were to come off Whittlesea Island and dig a trench and into that sediment, we'd see this deposit model. And this is very reminiscent of, of Graham Clark's Shipper Hill section, this sense of what he called the delicate chronological scale. This is his lower peat, fen clay, upper peat. This is the Neolithic, or Mesolithic at the very base, the Neolithic in the lower peat, the early Bronze Age above the fen clay, and then the upper silts being the sort of Roman deposits across the top. But what's more important about this image is, is what's called the pre-Flandrian surface, this gradient that disappears beneath that, that sediment and gives you this sense of this concave-shaped landscape that's filled up over time full of sediment. And what's happening is, is that the farmers are, are ploughing this landscape and eroding that silt and exposing that peat is that the channels, like shots of lightning, are, are appearing on the surface of the sediment and we can start to see them very clearly. And you can see the road that sort of traverses across the channel there. And these roads are very interesting to drive along because wherever a channel crosses them, you get this profile, you get this bump. And that, that double bump, that dip in the centre, is in effect, that's our channel. That's what we've been investigating. And when we take the Birkbeck students out into this landscape, if you go fast enough, the students on the back seat bang their heads on the ceiling when you hit the rod. So it's a sense that you're able to, you're able to actually find earthworks in a landscape that apparently is, is, is sort of flat in its, in its topography. So you can see here how, how where the channel goes under the road, the road sinks down into the channel itself. And here with the students, you can see I'm stood on the top of the, the banks of the channel and they're stood inside the dip. So you can see how the topography is subtle, but nevertheless, it's, it's very informative. 
And likewise, we even get soil marks where we can see the pale silts over the side and the dark silts running through the centre. And occasionally, when farmers clean out their dikes, we're able to jump down inside those ditches and see these channels expressed in the side and look for artefacts and just get some sort of characterisation of these channels. But the problem is, is that each time we do this, it's, these, are, these are very narrow apertures. They are thin sort of windows on this vast landscape of deep sediment and things. So it's, it's always a, a sort of tantalising sort of glimpse, but never really that sort of depth that you want to get at. And we're sort of relying on the sediment being brought up and sorting through it with metal detectors and pulling out fragments of beaver skeleton and, and lamb bones and things like that. And I think, in a way, this sort of gives you a sort of sense of what we understand about Fenland in general, in the sense that this model I put up on the, on the screen of the upland and then the Fen Basin with this sort of thick wad of sediment in it, is that the curve, that sort of S-shaped curve, in a way represents the sort of visibility. So you can see why we know lots about the upland and we know quite a bit about the Fen Edge, but we know very little about the, the depths of, of the Fenland Basin itself. And in a way, I feel as in my time working in the Fen, and I've sort of followed that curve. I started up at about four metres above sea level, and I'm now currently working at about four metres below sea level, sea level. And on that journey going down that edge, it's the sense of the sort of realisation or the articulation of this landscape. Now, I can put another curve on this image, which is the curve of preservation. So this sense that the upland gives you this sort of easy access to the archaeology, but it tends to be very poorly preserved. And you can see also why the Fen Edge has become to characterise the fence, because it's a sort of meeting of the two curves, the sense that there's still some visibility, but also there is some enhanced preservation. But where I'm working now, I feel like I've got the sort of best of both worlds. I'm both deep, but I've also got this exaggerated preservation as well. So that's the landscape I want to take you into. So how do I do that? Well, here you go. This is, this is Whittlesey Brick Pit. This is the Must Farm Quarry. This is this this aperture into that deep sediment. And at the base of that, you can see the Oxford clays, you can see the Pleistocene gravels. And then you can see a section, again, that would be familiar with Graham Clark, the lower peat, the fen clay, and the upper peat. And you can see various river channels cutting into it. And if you look into the background, you can see the chimneys of the power station of where the, the Flag Fen Causeway meets Peterborough, the mainland. And what's interesting about this image is, is that the two characters stood at the bottom of this section. One is an archaeologist, and one is a geologist. And you know when you're getting deep in archaeology is when you start coming across geologists in the same space. And it's that sense, really, that we've been given an opportunity within this pit where we're not drowning, where we're not being suffocated, we're not having sections collapsing on our heads. We're actually able to explore these sediments in a way that is just, you know, I can imagine Graham Clark seeing this and just thinking what, a, what an opportunity that would be to, to get to the bottom of the fence in, in such an easy way. And it's that opportunity afforded by the quarry itself. So what I'm trying to do now is look at a landscape not from the surface down but from the bottom up and actually bring that sediment back in and the history of that sediment and the knowledge that the sediment is commensurate with British prehistory. It is the Holocene. So if we look at the Flag Fen Basin we take all the various investigations that's been going on around the edge of it including Fen Gate and Bradley Fen and our excavations down here at Must Farm, we're able to create a, a contour, a, a, a pre-Flandrian surface and we're able to give that contour a, a sort of tone. And then we're able then to actually reintroduce that sediment into this landscape. So what we're finding is, as we look at the base of all of that peat and silt, is that we start off terrestrial and we end up aquatic. And it's that's happening over time. So we can, we can reintroduce the sediment. And as we do that over time, so we're going through the early Bronze Age to the Middle Bronze Age, right through to the to the Iron Age, you can see how the Flagfen Basin is being created, you can see how Whittlesea becomes an island, and you can see how the shoreline of Fengate is created. So the sense that this landscape is dynamic, and the sense that settlement is being displaced by, by the introduction of the sediment as well. So that's my context, that's the, the location of Must Farm, and that's its relationship to Flagfen. Now, I could have come here today and talked about a, a Neolithic landscape made up of oval barrows and, and flint scatters and things, and, and a landscape that would look like any other landscape in southern Britain. It's a river valley, it's, it's surrounded by monuments, and that's the image that you see on the left-hand side. But instead I'm going to be talking about the, the Flag Fen Basin, so the, the image on the right-hand side, so you can see the sort of little fen embayment, you can see the field systems of, of Fengate 
and of Bradley Fenn, and you can see our paleo channel coming in and going up through Peterborough. And it's that landscape that is the context of the Must Farm timber platform. It's also the context of the Flag Fenn Causeway and also of a causeway that we found at Must Farm. And you start to see how this landscape starts to become sort of integrated and then the sort of connections that we have between the different features. So back to our big section. So because we're doing the end of the story, we're looking at the top of the section. And you can see that big dark smile over on the right-hand side. This here is our paleo channel. This is our, our investigations. But you can also see there are lots of V-cuts underneath those. And it's interesting what happens to rivers in the fens. At the beginning of our story, we could walk down the edge of the gravel terraces and we could have gone for a swim or used the river valley as our means of transport and things. But as those sediments are introduced into that landscape, the rivers end up becoming detached or dislocated from the land itself. And we end up where basically we're living on the land, but the rivers are now separated from us by marshland. And it's that dislocation, I think, is what's going on at Must Farm itself. It's that sense of people try to reconcile that relationship to the rivers. The river valleys are the conduits, they are the networks, they are the, the routeways through this landscape. So it's, it's no surprise that this moment in, in this diagram is when the Flagfen Causeway and the Must Farm Causeway and things like that are being constructed. But also you'll see in this smile at the top there, you can see our channel. We've been excavating that channel since 2009. And here it is in its, in its sort of glory, four metres of sediment. It's fresh water. <coughs> It dates to 1600 BC at the bottom and 100 BC at the top. So it has 1500 years of silt, and that silt is forming in, in a very still, sluggish way. There's nothing dynamic about this river channel. It's basically, it's a, it's a, it's a canal, it's a sort of linear lake in its sort of formation and things. And as we excavate this channel, at its base, we're finding fish weirs dating to about 1600, 1500 BC, and they are still intact. They are there as woven pieces of wood forming these chevron shapes across the channel. And in association with these fish weirs, we're finding fish traps. And in a stretch of 300 metres of river channel, we have 28 of these fish traps dotted along the length of the channel itself, and all coming back with radiocarbon dates of sort of 1600, 1500 BC. So they're middle Bronze Age in date. And they sit in that lower profile of that, of that river channel. In association with those traps, we also found nine log boats, again within that single stretch of the channel. And these boats have a, have a date range from, a, from the middle of the Bronze Age right through to the sort of middle of the Iron Age. We've got boats made from oak, boats made from lime, um, complete boats, boats that look like Cambridge punts. And you can see in this image, actually, you can see the scale of our excavation. You can see how our channel is being preserved by the nature of the build-up of sediment. So, there is a real sort of absence here of truncation. There's a real sense here of preservation, not just of the organic, but also of the landscape itself, of the spaces that these, these boats were actually being played out in. And there's a real sense, I think, that when we were excavating this site, there was a real sense that we weren't necessarily doing what we thought was normal orthodox archaeology. There was a sort of feeling that we were actually... I don't know, there was a... This is going to sound a bit strange, but a real sense that if we got a bit quicker about what we'd do, we'd catch the buggers up. It was as if they were, they were just around the bend sort of thing. This sort of sense of the, the articulation, the, the, the way things appeared to be sort of in situ. And this is the, the Middle Iron Age boat right towards the, the sort of upper part of the channel. And what's great about the channel is, is that because it has this chronology or this sediment um, accretion, is that we can put the boats in their, their sequence. So the boat at the bottom here is at the bottom of the channel, or the boat at the top was sort of towards the top of the channel. So we get a sense here, not only are we seeing a sense of articulation, articulation about how the channel's used, but also we're seeing material culture played out through time. Same time as the fish traps and the fish weirs and the boats, we also started finding lots of metal work. So we're getting spears with a wooden shaft still attached to them, swords with a pommel still present, and swords even with their wooden handles and their wooden scabbards still present. So the, the sword on the right-hand side is a late lieutenant, it's an iron sword, and the sword on the left-hand side is a leaf-shaped sword, but you can see it's pommel in the box below. Things. And just like the boats, we can place that metalwork in that same sequence. So we have Middle Bronze Age rapiers towards the base of the channel, and then late lieutenant swords towards the top. 
So you see what's happening here. It's this it's sort of you feel like it's it's made very easy for you as an archaeologist in order to try and understand the sort of I don't know how things are being played out both in space and in time. So that's the channel. That's what we investigated back in 2009, 10, and 11, and 12. And you can see the the sort of the arrangement here, the sort of V-shaped weirs and the fish traps and the boats and things coming round. And now I want to focus on the Must Farm timber platform and that red rectangle downstream from that section of, of the channel and a site that we started excavating um, just over a year ago um, and, and basically give you a sort of sense of, of what happened in that excavation and our understanding of that site and its relationship to the sort of landscape description I've given you so far. So this is the quarry and you can see a big white rectangle with a red line around it. That's our investigations on the edge of the quarry. We put up a big tent, basically, a big, a big warehouse over the excavation. But this enabled us to do something very important, I think, in terms of the excavation of this site, which is that we could dig it in its entirety. We were able to not worry about covering it and uncovering it and constantly, basically, stepping over what we just excavated. We're ba we were able to come into the door each morning and get straight back on with the excavation. And it meant that we were able to articulate context. And there's a real sense here of a sort of dynamic of, of a piece of wetland archaeology. So this is inside our shed. We give you a sense of this sort of environment and things. There's the scaffold going up. You can see the wood coming up through the sediment. And this is our sort of daily routine. So a lot of the time we find ourselves sort of suspended off planks and things, dangling down with sponges and wetting wood and removing silt and things, but also the sort of intensity of, of our sampling and, and the dealing with the sheer intensity of, of wooden art, um, artefacts. And equally at the same time, we were taking the sediment out and pushing it through a four mil mesh. This is, this is a shopping trolley, I think it's courtesy of Morrison's, um, and you can see we've got a shopping basket in there, but it, 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 essentially we were able to push that sediment through and, and, and really be quite sort of microscopic about the sort of detail. So that sort of circle, that pie chart of artefacts there includes sort of spores of pottery and calcined bone and um, fish scales and fish teeth and charcoal and things like that. <coughs> But the predominant thing about the site was this, this sense of, of the conflagration, the sense that, that here is a timber structure that got burnt down, and, and this sort of crocodile scaling on the wood was the sort of common theme of, of the excavation, but also of the rest of the material culture. But also, I suppose, the, the thing that flabbergasted us and, and all visitors that came to the site was the, the sheer sort of, I don't know, intensity, but also, again, um, the patterning of of the roofs uh, of the timbers themselves and things. So here's one of the roof fans within within the structure. But I just want to give you a, a sense of our recording technique. So this is photogrammetry. You can see that we're able then to, to draw the individual timbers, which in turn enab enable us to create this plan. So the white box you see is is the limit of our excavation. And what you see in here is is the wood mass. So to give you a sort of an introduction to this, most of the horizontal timbers were charred and were part of the superstructure and all of the vertical timbers were uncharred but were waterlogged and were part of the sort of the foundations of that superstructure and, and were within the river channel itself. The channel basically goes across our, our image. And if we take the wood away, we get back to a, a series of posts and it's this pattern that we're trying to disentangle and understand about the sort of history of the site. And you'll notice that there's a sort of band of posts going across, sort of diagonally, across this group, going along here. And this represents an earlier feature in our, in our site story. And these are giant oak piles driven into the channel, um, regularly spaced. They're characterised by the fact that they're either cut into the square or, or octagonal forms. Uh, they are, they've lost their, their bark and their sapwood, and they've given us a dendrit chronological um, felling date of spring 1284 BC. So we actually have a causeway going across this part of our site that predates the first alignments at Flag Fen. And this causeway is characterised as saying about these, by, by these large oak piles, sometimes driven metres into the underlying sediment. And each one was characterised also by these handles that were carved on the side. You can see them. This was a very common factor on each of these uprights. The deposition associated with this, this causeway or bridge or, or, or post alignment going across our channel was perhaps as expected, 
mostly to do with metalwork. So this sort of reminiscent of the sort of flag fan story. But we were finding um, Middle Bronze Age rapiers, um, loop spears, and also this wonderful um, coit headed pin going along the sort of southwestern side of the causeway itself. And in addition, we're also finding these huge timbers that once spanned across the top. So the sense of this sort of piece of timber architecture, but also what we're recognising is that this thing had collapsed and was covered in sediment before our settlement was constructed. So there was a, a dislocation in, in that story. So back to our plan, and back to our wood mass, you can start to think about the settlement and the, and the palisade that encloses it and the raised walkway that was sat along its edge. And then the identification of individual structures sat within there. Now, when we first started excavating the site, I think we sort of felt like because we were digging these sort of pile dwellings, we thought well, all of our buildings would be rectangular in shape and things. And it came as quite a surprise that they were circular and they were sort of eight metres in diameter and ever so slightly cliched in the sense that they looked like a roundhouse that you dig up on a dry land and things. There is this sort of familiarity about their plan. So this is structure one or roundhouse one. Um, you can see the, the palisade running down the right-hand side of the, the image, and you can see the, the posts and the, the fan of the roof rafters sitting in the river sediment. And if I highlight the post, you can see that we've got the red line of the palisade with a raised walkway running on the inside, and then you've got that outer blue ring of ten posts and an inner green ring of six posts that forms the sort of superstructure of, or, or the foundations of the superstructure of Roundhouse One. And then in turn, we can put the rafters back on and there's a raised walkway in the background. It's a sense here of this sort of articulation, this idea that not only have we found structures, but the roof's still on and that we were able to take the roof away. And what's important about this image is, is that Ian Tyres, who's doing the dendrochronology, has looked at the tree ring data for the palisade and the oak piles and the oak rafters. And so far, he's unable to give us an exact date, but he's telling us that they were all failed at the same time. So here we have a settlement that was built in one go. We have a year zero, we just don't know when that year zero is. But we know that it's, it's a winter sometime in the late Bronze Age. So here's a settlement that's built as one phase. The other thing he's telling us about this is that when he looks at the burnt timbers of the roof rafters, where the, the charring has occurred, there's some distortion to the tree rings around the outside. And he thinks that if this, these oak rafters were seasoned, that could not have happened. So not only does he think the settlement was built in one, but he thinks the wood was still green when the settlement got burnt down. And oak takes about a year to season. So there's a possibility that our settlement went up, and within 12 months it was burnt down. So here's the palisade in its, in its sort of glory, really, the sense of you can see these ash poles with the bark still on them, you can see the tool marks of the cutting of these, and a sense that there's a sort of an expediency about them. These are, you know, hundreds of ash poles. Someone's been able to collect them, similar diameter, quickly cut, cut a pencil end to them and, and drive them into the river sills. Equally, the oak posts of the roundhouses, you can see they're three metres into the sediment. They've still got their bark on them. And there's nothing remarkable about, about these e individual uprights. They're basically trees with their branches cut off and a point stuck on the end, and they're driven into the sediment itself. And here's one that you can see is taking it out of the ground, the sort of scale of it, but also the woodworking as well. And it's oak and ash. There's just That's the species of, of the settlement. And you can see the sort of intensity of material and the sort of detail that we've got to, to record. So back to our structure. So the next thing of, of articulating it and finding the roof and things is to take the roof off and go inside a roundhouse and see what was inside. So that's what we did. We took away the, the roof rafters. And as we were doing that, we were recognising that the timbers themselves were full of information. So because this fire event had happened, we could see where other timbers were resting against parts of that structure and basically masking them from the fire. So you can see on this one, there's a series of little dots where there were uprights stuck on this, this mortise beam. But the general sort of deposit that we were investigating was made up of collapsed architecture, burnt material culture, turfs, clay, and thatch-like clumps. And what's more important, I think, or, or more interesting about that also, is the sense that there was no depth to this, this deposit. There was a sense that there was a river happening, there was this collapse of all this material, and then it went back to being a river again. 
So when we first started looking at this section, we thought that it was very conflated. But now with that information from the dendrochronology, we understand that that conflation is actually is, is real. It, it's a true manifestation of, of the duration of the settlement. It's gone up, it's caught fire, and it's come back down again. So there's, there's a, a, sort of, a, a sort of moment in the, in the channel's history made up of this sort of ash rain and, and material culture. Around the outside of the buildings, we were finding these sort of formative middens, things with animal bones, pot sherds, caches of little small round pebbles, um, a b broken bits of withing and things. And in the majority, not affected by the fire, so they were already happening before the settlement had burnt down. And this was giving us some indication about what was actually going on in the settlement itself. So the predominant animal bone coming from these sort of formative middens was, to our surprise, made up of red deer, roe deer and wild boar. Um, on top of that, we were also finding cow, sheep, pig, dog. But what we weren't finding were feminine species. There wasn't that sense that we were coming across fish and fowl and things like that. Inside the buildings, we've got a, a very different pattern. Inside the structures, we were finding three to six month old lamb skeletons or disarticulated lambs that have been butchered or cleaved down the centre. And from our on site sieving, we're also now starting to recognise that we've got carbonised sheep poo, we've got basically lamb pellets from inside the structures as well. So you start to see the sort of level of detail that's coming out from this. And there's a real sense here that of inside the structure that things tended to be either complete or in articulation, but outside the structure they were fragmented. So there's this sort of contrast between inside and outside of Roundhouse One. And we've got, we've got a horse spine here and we've got the skull of a dog. And amongst that, inside the structures, we're finding complete pots and complete wooden vessels. See here, these are some of the wooden vessels. And we've got over 180 wooden vessels from the site, and that goes from everything from buckets to platters to bowls to, to handles, um, halves and things like that, a real sense. And again, you can see the burning patterns on, on those to show that they were once up, in that, up on the settings themselves. And this is a, a stitched bark sort of platter. And you can actually see there's a ceramic pot sort of cutting through at the base of it there. And then pots, lots of pots, and pots of different sizes. So we've got everything from that tiny little finger bowl right through to, um, you see this little pedestal cup, um, these sort of courseware bowls, and then including these giant storage vessels, vessels about this sort of size. And when we started digging this one, we had one big storage vessel we took part of it away and there was a medium sized one inside of that and we took that away and there was a small one inside of that. So it's that sort of nested set. This is, this is the John Lewis wedding set sort of caught up in our, in our excavation and things. And this sense really, I suppose, of, I don't know, you, can, you sort of start to realise what's going on here. We've got a, a settlement that's built, it goes up and it comes down quickly and we've got all these complete pots. There's a sort of, it's as if there hasn't been time to break things or even there hasn't been time to use things. There's a sense here of this sort of, we've moved in and we've furnished it. And again, another pot inside a pot. So this sense of this sort of, I don't know, the sort of the kitchen wares, the, 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 the vessels of, of the settlement and things. Um, so we've got everything from tiny little cups right up to large storage vessels. And, and Matt Brudnell, our pottery specialist, is saying the other thing that's really interesting about these vessels is that they're all the same. There's a uniformity of form. And this sense that it may be, to use his expression, maybe we're looking at the hand of a single potter that's caught within this settlement as well. So we've got the sort of full set. And then what comes with these pots is their contents. So in that fire event, they're, they're, the food remains inside were being carbonised. There's this sense that we've got these sort of little sort of creme brulees in there that sort of got these sort of toasted tops and things. And the pot that I've showed on the top here with the food crust, when we excavated that, we found that there was a wooden spoon still stuck in the top. So, so this sort of, I don't know, the, the various analogies to this site, I don't know, the Pompeii, the fens and things, you can see where some of those sort of stories come from and things in terms of, of, of what we're finding. And BioArc are currently looking at the lipids and the, the organic residues within these pots and trying to get at the actual sort of the food remains themselves. So we're getting household inventories, but we're also we're getting a sense here, I think, of what was on the menu and things like that. And that, in that spread, we're also finding saddle querns. And what's interesting is that the saddle querns appear to be sort of one or two per household. So, and I quite like this in the sense that the saddle querns almost give us a sort of balance to the material culture. Because if we started finding 20 saddle querns per roundhouse, we'd stop being suspicious about the sort of quantities and things. But because we're getting sort of one or two per house, it makes you wonder that maybe the, the, 
there's surprising amounts of pots and things, and maybe it's not great numbers. Maybe this is typical of what's happening within a, a later Bronze Age roundhouse. And this is one of these flint saddle querns from inside um, structure one. You can see it's shattered, but basically it's caught in the fire, it's hit the water and it's exploded. And you can see we've got beads as well coming out of the structure. So this is a, the orange bead in the centre is an amber bead, there's a jet bead in the background, there's a stone bead in the foreground, then it's surrounded by these sort of green and black glass beads. I think there's a collection here of 22, some sort of composite necklace, was in the northeastern quadrant of, of structure one. Um, you can see the amber bead here, you can see how it has also been affected by, by the fire. And then you can see the, the glass beads um, from, the, from the same group. And Julian Henderson and Andy Tarlow looking at the, the sort of composition of these, the, the sort of chemical makeup and things, are saying that they're made from plant ash. And the suggestion is that they're actually coming from the Mediterranean. They are, and they are, they are 9th century in date, so they're in currency. This, these aren't curated items, these are things that are part of the, the sort of the world, or, or contemporary with our world. And then perhaps most spectacularly is the, the sense that in terms of the carbonised meat sort of organic preservation is the, the textile range. So these are bobbins of, of spun thread wound around them. You can see one in close up here. Um, we have 22 of these um, across the excavation. Uh, they're occurring in most of the oops, sorry, most of the structures. Little balls of, of, of spun thread. I'll just give you some sort of, uh, and this is what I was saying earlier about the idea of texture, I suppose, in terms of our, our excavation. Some knotted bags. And then it's very finely woven um, cloth. And in, very, in fact, consistently across our textiles, they're all plant fibres. They're all being made from flax and nettles and lime bast and things like that. And there's this weft twining as well. And perhaps just to sort of how Must Farm sort of keeps giving you these sort of surprises and things is these are plant fibres that have not been spun. They've been aligned and they've been put into bundles. And we've got, I think it's something like 17 of these, um, all within structure one. So this sense that there's actual textile production going on within, within the structures as well. And loom weights and spindle whirls. And what looks like the sort of earliest evidence for cricket bats in, in the United Kingdom. These are, these are cloth beaters, um, again, from, I think, ones from structure one. And then adding to that sort of sense of the sort of outside the structures of things is the, the wooden wheel, the tripartite wheel. And what's nice is that we've got fragments of a second wheel nearby, so the sense that we've got two, two wheels. So rather than it just being a spare, the sort of sense that maybe that we've got some sort of cart or something. And what's nice about this object also, I think, is it, it's, it starts to sort of summarise a lot of else of what's going on with this settlement in the sense that there's this sort of conundrum here. Here we are living in a river in the fens and yet we have a settlement that's made up of terrestrial trees, terrestrial animals, we're getting barley and wheat um, and then here we've got wheels and things. So this sort of link between our settlement and the adjacent, lands, the adjacent land. And I'm just a, it's the sort of really, I mean maybe I should just shut up and just press the button and give you slides really. It's just a sense of but I suppose what I'm trying to do is, I'm not trying to show off, I'm trying to give you a sense of intensity, I think, the sheer quantity of stuff that's coming out of these structures and things. So lots of tools, razors and sickles and gouges. Um, this is a, a, a billet or something like that. And that ratio of sort of 60% 60, 60 tools, 24% weapons and things. And most of the households um, containing at least 10 metalwork items. The majority of the tools, or the, the largest proportion, were axes, and a lot of these things were also still hafted, so you can see we've got a hafted spear and a gouge and, and two axes. We also found a, a wooden bucket that had the remnants of a sort of scrap hoard, so this is where most of the weapons came from, so broken up swords and, and spears and things caught within, within the bucket. And then a, a wooden haft without a, a metal tool, and then a, a, ha a hafted axe, but that's not burnt. And this was found almost like a foundation deposit underneath Roundhouse One, pre-conflagation. So to come to sort of the end really I suppose is just the sense that 
this is the beginning, I suppose, of our interrogation or our scrutiny of these patterns of material culture, in a sense that we have a, a roundhouse that has this sort of patterns of deposits. So the pots tend to be in the northeastern quarter, the metalwork on the eastern edge, and the textiles in the, the, the southeastern quarter. And this seems to be repeated across each, each of our structures. There's a sense here of routine or, or of common practice across the individual roundhouses. And also a sense of the architecture. So we've got things like redeposited turves and lumps of clay that have come from the adjacent dry land. You see here some of those, those lumps of clay. These are basically BC horizons from the, the sort of Fengate shoreline. Um, lumps of sort of burnt thatch or bedding, the causeways. And then potential candidates for these sort of lightly woven floors and walls, these sort of sprung surfaces. And then these unusual sort of diagonal posts sat beneath the floors forming these sort of arches and things, which perhaps was basically supporting raised floors. So we think we excavated this in profile. So the uprights, the collapsed roof rafters, the pots, the clays, the sediments and things. And we, we think that maybe that once upon a time it looked something like this. That these were stilted roundhouses built above the watercourse and that burnt down. The problem we've got, I suppose, is that we've got two stories at the moment. We've got one which is the in-situ middens and the uprights, the unburnt side of the site, and the other is this sort of ash rain sitting up here. And what we're trying to do now is, is to bring those two things back together again and, and, and recreate that, that articulation of, of, of our site. We also think that we got about half the site. The, the quarry was first being um, extracted back in the late 60s, and we think we basically lost the other side of the channel. So if we've got five structures, maybe there were ten within, within the palisade enclosure. And maybe it looks something like this. In an elevation. So... We've got a bit of a contradiction here, I suppose, in the sense that we've got a wetland environment, we're in a river in the fens, but we've got, to all intents and purposes, a dryland economy. These people, their, their world is made up of oak and ash and of deer and boar and things like that. In a sense, that, and it, it's quite interesting in a sense that the story was within the fens was that the idea that you moved out onto the fen edge or into the fens because you wanted to exploit that environment for all of its rich resources and things. And it, these guys seem to be not about that at all. There's a, there's a different world going on here. Um, and also this sense of, of the duration of our settlement. So our year zero, let's say January, the winter of, of, I don't know, our understanding is from the dendral information is that we're pushing our world into the 9th century BC. So sometime after 900, but before 800 BC was the, the time of our settlement. And it's that idea that because we've got three to six month old lambs in articulation, but also we've got unshed antlers still attached to the skulls of red deers, that perhaps within the window of the seasoned oak, maybe this site's being burnt down in September, October of whatever year that was. We're hoping that if Dendro doesn't answer the question that through radio carbon dating, we should get within on a sort of wiggle matching within 30 years of the actual date of the settlement itself. So I've given you a story, I suppose, of, of two timber structures. One was a causeway, which was about basically linking a piece of dry land to another piece of dry land. It was about that, that guessing around the edge of the Flagfen Basin. And the second was about people that were basically purposefully building their structures on a river in the fens, but at the same time had a strong tie to the adjacent dry land. They were, still, they were still farmers, and there was still that sense of that sort of terrestrial personality about their world and things. And it, it sort of brings into the idea the sort of sense of the sort of European data, the, the idea of the sort of lake dwellings, where they talk in, in their landscapes about the sort of the Swiss lake villages as the lakes start to rise, people leave those landscapes and move up onto the, the higher ground and become farmers. They leave that sort of lakeland economy and things. Whereas in our world, it seems to be that we've got farmers in the Middle Bronze Age living up on the, the dry land, and as the, the waters are rising, they're actually going out and living on these rivers, but maintaining this sort of terrestrial character. So it's that sense, I think, is really that they are... They are tied to these waterways. These are their conduits, these are their networks, this is the, the spaces that, that they want to occupy. What I find interesting is that we didn't go and excavate the site because we knew it was there, or we had some great insight in terms of our research. We went there because there happened to be a large hole in that part of the landscape. So either we are the luckiest archaeologists ever, or what we're actually demonstrating is, is that this channel is like this elsewhere on along its length, and that what we're actually seeing is pattern 
on a much bigger scale. And that's the implication. So I might be guilty sometimes of trying to sort of, I don't know, play down the, the sort of the importance of the settlement or, 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 I don't know, accentuate its sort of mundaneness and things. But I'm, I'm, I'm I don't know, I'm, I'm determined, I suppose, that I don't, I don't want Musk Farm to become some sort of anomaly of preservation and for it to actually be about its context and about its story within the landscape itself and what it might tell us about the rest of Fenland and what might happen if you can take away four or five metres of sediment what you might find within that landscape. So I leave you with an image of the Fenland Basin and all those ever dendritic channels and all that possibility and the hope that maybe we can get Forterra to pick up their brick pit and start moving it around the landscape or something like that. And also maybe, and the, the, the fact that the quarry takes so many years to advance that I live long enough to see the, the next, I don't know, 20 years of, of that sediment being exposed. So on that I'll say thank you very much. <laughs>